we've done other simulations, uh, a slightly different number of bubbles, different bubble sizes, um, bubbles in slightly different channel, channel sizes, bubbles injected at different times, and so on. And I think we're fairly confident that the results, namely that deformable bubbles in these small channels can cause a drag reduction when we specify a constant flow rate, are actually real and will hold up under closer scrutiny. The obvious question is, how does that relate to the larger scale flows? In particular, how does that relate to the flows that are being experimented with by Cessio down in the large cavitation channel? Obviously, the domain size in those experiments is much larger than the one we have been considering, and the Reynolds numbers are huge and much larger. However, we have tried to select the parameters in wall units in such a way that the results are actually comparable. And given the fact that uh, it is only the bubbles that are very close to the wall that have any impact on the flow, uh, I think the assumption that there is some relations is not completely unfounded. Uh, it is true that the bubble sizes that CSU has been looking at are a little bit larger. They're about 100 wall units, whereas ours are only about half of that, uh, selected in part because we don't want the bubble to reach across half the channel. Uh, their Weber numbers are slightly larger than ours, but not enormously so. We've also looked at other things like the Stokes number, the rate response time of the bubble to the flow, and we find actually that the Stokes numbers are relatively close, which is sort of obvious once we are working in wall units. We've also looked at things like the volume fraction, measured as the area fraction through slices cut through the bubbles close to the wall, and again, we find that those are close. So the probability, I think, that the uh, results that we have obtained have some relevance to help explain what the is seeing is actually fairly high. Um, however, uh, the re it remains to be examined what happens at higher Reynolds numbers and larger domains. Uh, we've started to do a little bit of that, as I mentioned uh, just near the end of the talk. In addition to help explain what is going on, the detailed data obtainable from the simulation can also provide data for uh, turbulence quantities. Obviously, if we were going to model these flows, we have to find a way to incorporate the mechanisms that we have elucidated into turbulence models. And the first step is to gather the various turbulence data and see how the presence of the bubbles affect it. In this particular slide, I've plotted the turbulent kinetic energy averaged over planes parallel to the wall. Uh, on one wall, we don't see too much difference where we added the bubbles, but on the other wall, we see that the turbulent kinetic energy has been reduced uh, uh, relatively um, largely. Uh, overall, we find that the turbulence kinetic energy does fluctuate. It tends to be a little bit smaller than what we see for flows without bubbles, uh, but generally we don't find too much uh, change in turbulent kinetic energy. We do, however, find uh, consistent uh, and persistent changes in other quantities. In this particular slide, I plot two turbulence quantities, namely the dissipation uh, at one particular time and the turbulence kinetic energy production. And in both cases, we see that both have been reduced significantly by the presence of the bubbles. As I said earlier, the obvious question is what happens in larger channels and at larger Reynolds numbers. Um, we have started doing some simulations with larger channels, um, and I'm showing you an example of a one channel that is twice as long and twice as wide uh, in this slide. Um, we have simulated it up to a relatively early time, and we see trends that are consistent with what we have seen in the simulations in the smaller channels. However, these calculations are very time consuming and take a lot of manpower to monitor them. And at the moment, we don't really have that manpower. So we're actually pursuing other aspects of uh, turbulent public flows uh, at the present time. In spite of the success of our study of drag reduction by bubble injection, we are actually not pursuing that problem further at the moment. Uh, we are, however, engaged in other studies of public flows. Uh, and it has become clear that one of the big obstacles that we face now is not so much how to do larger and larger simulations. Uh, that's for the most part is a matter of computer time and the time of somebody to monitor those simulations. But uh, what to do with the results? Unlike flows, homogeneous turbulence flows, where um, over the last two decades there's been enormous advances in the modeling of turbulence flows by the introductions of large eddy simulations and so on, uh, in multi-phase flows, we are still operating with a two-fluid model, which actually has its origin uh, about a couple of decades ago. And there has been relatively little progress in actually in modeling or in how to incorporate the results from direct numerical simulations into advanced models. Um, we still don't know very much about how to mo modify the kinetic energy equation, the dissipation e equation, and so on. And for the most part, we simply assume that the bubbles are point particles and 
uh, interact with the flow through the barrier's forces. Obviously, in, as the present results show, for drag reduction, it's not the forces that the bubbles have on the flow, but it is the modification of the turbulent flow by the bubbles that matters. To start to try to um, close this gap to advanced models for multiphase bubbly flows to a degree where we can actually use the data from direct numerical simulations to help us uh, improve the closure, we have done a few simulations, They're still pretty preliminary, but we're pursuing that further. What I'm showing in this slide is actually two two-dimensional simulations of bubbly flows in a channel. Uh, in both cases, the buoyancy uh, drives the bubbles upward, but in the uh, left-hand side, the flow is upward, therefore the bubbles will accumulate near the walls. Uh, and in the right-hand side, the bubble flow is downward, so the bubbles migrate more toward the core. Uh, as you see, the, the migration is not very prominent, uh, but as you will see from the models in the next slide, uh, in this particular case, it shouldn't be very prominent. This slide shows the average results from the channel flows that I showed you in your earlier slide with the relatively simple turbulence uh, bubbly models, two fluid models by um, Dick Leahy and company, published several years ago, uh, for cha laminar channel flows. Obviously, this is a flow that has been studied extremely well, and therefore you would expect the results to agree very well. Uh, we have had to adjust the parameters a little bit because the flow here is two-dimensional. But for the overall, um, overall conclusion is that the results are rather good, except um, for the upflow where the bubbles accumulate near the wall, we see some discrepancy between our average results and what the model predictions. Um, this is, of course, encouraging because um, the, in this particular case, we would expect the models to do well, uh, but this is a first step in trying to um, improve the models um, with data inputted from direct numerical simulations. We hope that we will have a lot more to say about this in the not too far future. The simulations that I have presented have shown that uh, we indeed can see drag reduction in relatively small tur turbulence channels when we inject deformable bubbles next to the walls. Uh, we have provided a plausible mechanism for that, and uh, we have also provided a plausible mechanism for why uh, less deformable bubbles can actually cause drag increase. The major uncertainty is, of course, that the channel is very, very small, and the Reynolds number is very, very low. Uh, we've done preliminary calculation in a little larger channel uh, for only a short uh, time on a relatively fine grid. Uh, we've done some calculations on coarser grid, again, uh, for a little longer time. And those all suggest that the mechanisms that we have seen will survive in larger channels. Um, we have not done calculations at a higher Reynolds number, but higher Reynolds number corresponds essentially to a wider channel. And um, since the bubbles only affect the flow ne very near close to the wall, it seems unlikely that going to higher Reynolds number by enlarging the channel would lead to a fundamental differences. Uh, we have injected a different number of bubbles, we have uh, injected the bubbles at different time, and under all these circumstances, the drag reduction mechanism survives. The simulations have also resulted in a large amount of data about the evolution of the turbulent flow in the channels and how the bubbles affect the evolution. Uh, these informations, particularly as they relate to, say, dissipation and production of turbulence, should be very useful in models that capture the behavior of bubbles or the effect of bubbles of near-wall turbulence. Of course, current models uh, don't do very well um, near walls, and they don't do very well when you add bubbles, so there's still a considerable amount of work that needs to be done to link those better together and to use the data that we have gathered to improve such models. The mechanism that we have proposed is specific to bubbles that are relatively large compared to the vertical structure next to the wall. Uh, for smaller bubbles, uh, obviously the same mechanism would not hold. The mechanism that we have proposed is therefore um, specific to bubbles which have been generated by pumping air through the wall and whose size is determined by a balance between the shear near the wall and surface tension. Those bubbles, of course, are, are likely to be slightly deformable, just as Steve sees in his experiments and um, the bubbles that we have been looking at in the simulations. For much smaller bubbles, if such bubbles results in crack reduction, the mechanism is, a bit, is likely to be somewhat different. And in, there is therefore no conflict really between what we have found here and um, explanations that have been proposed for much smaller bubbles. We are simply looking at a very different um, parameter range 